court will affect the jury's decision. I'll take the last one first. And by the way, great questions. His mannerisms are not helping him in the courtroom. You just don't need the jurors to feel that those weird things he's doing are disrespectful to the court because they're going to make an analogy. And maybe as a prosecutor, I want to sum up, if this is the way he takes it as a joke or whatever you hear, can you imagine what he's capable of doing outside of the courtroom? So I'll just leave that aside. As a defense lawyer, you just don't need that. Uh, with respect to the mistrial, motion. Great question. There's a lot of nuance here. Let's get to it. On the motion for a mistrial, what I had imagined the defense would have done, and Brian can see if he confirmed, and each state's a little bit different, is that if the judge were to have granted it, the defense would have then indicated that they want to have the case dismissed for double jeopardy grounds. They would have argued that this mistrial was done because of purposeful, outrageous conduct by prosecutors and that he should not be convicted uh, or brought to trial a second time. Now, that's a really hard standard in most most instances. But what the defense attorney clearly wants to do is create a record for a And, and if the judge denies all these things, an appellate court can revisit it. But Angie, here is the tactical issue here. When you have a really good case and your case is going well, a lot of times you make these motions because you have to preserve the record hoping the judge denies the motion because if the judge were to say, in mistrial, but I'm not granting double jeopardy, so we go back to square one. The defense can't guarantee on the second act or the second play that the testimony is going to be as good because they've already let their cards out to a certain extent. So a lot of times you want to win the battle by losing or win the war by losing that battle. So it's a really sophisticated and nuanced thing here. But the judge actually did them a favor. The judges often say, you know what, I'm not granting a mistrial. Now you prosecutors have created an appellate issue in this case. Now I'm going to give a curative instruction to this jury to say what you did was wrong and that they should dis regarded and then the defense lawyers can say whoo wow now we don't have to have another trial from the beginning when our trial's going in so well right now good insight from you bob bianchi uh, i'm going to send this next question to you terry austin it's from slap shoddy from tiktok what if melly gets the death penalty and later on we find out it wasn't him well, that's a good question. I mean, that's part of the issue many people have with the death penalty. There is no room for any sort of mistake. And there is a distinct possibility that if convicted, he could get the death penalty because we know that the Governor DeSantis just signed a new law that says it doesn't have to be unanimous 12-0. It can be 8-4. to four. And so it is a bigger possibility that that death sentence could be issued here. So if it's the wrong answer, and ultimately some of the other people that the defense pointed to who said might have been suspects in this case, but that the prosecution didn't go after them, if we find out later that someone else did it, or perhaps that, you know, Henry did it and Melly didn't do it, whatever the scenario is, if you find something out later, it is too late if in fact that death sentence has been issued and executed. Now, I will say that it does take years because oftentimes there are appeals as there should be because it's a very final sentence so hopefully you know if it gets to that point it's the right conclusion but that is in fact a very serious problem with the death penalty you have to be absolutely correct yeah, definitely. And, you know, a lot of people have a lot of questions about that lower threshold now for that law that Governor DeSantis just signed back in April. So this is just a recent thing that's happened. Uh, we'll send this question to you, Brian Buckmeyer. Horatio27 from TikTok asks, do you think the prosecutor will bring up prior bad acts such as the shooting that happened? Um... So there should have been a ruling on it already as to whether or not it came in. The only other thing the prosecutor could do 
is try to question a witness in a way that opens the door. Or maybe if the defense puts on uh, someone on the stand, this might actually be a reason why YNW and Melly doesn't testify. Not necessarily because of anything that happened in this uh, case or this incident, but because of prior bad acts. If he goes up there and says, I never touched the gun, I've never touched a gun in my life. Then they get to attack that second half of it and say, hey, here are other cases, here are other videos, here are other photos of you showing the gun, and that prejudice could come in based on his own words. So do I think the prior bad acts will come in? At this point, I think if there's a ruling on it, no. However, testimony in the future, whether it be YNW Melly himself or other witnesses, could potentially open the door to it. Let's go to our next question for Bob Bianchi. Uh, this is from At Legend Dad 2013 from Twitter. Why are they charging Melly with two first degree murders when the other person in the car, Bortland, could have pulled the trigger? Well, uh, that kind of gets back to what Terry was talking about before. Listen, ha having tried death penalty cases, the number one rule is you have to be absolutely convinced at who the person is that shot the individual. You, you can't have any hesitation about that. There could be no other explanation. So you also have to have aggravating factors in a case in order to get the death penalty. In this particular case, I think the aggravating factors against Melly are very weak to begin with, and they're certainly going to be weaker to the co-defendants or even aiders or in abettors with regard to whether those aggravating factors exist sufficient enough to justify the imposition of the death penalty. So a shooter you get, the people that may have been surrounding him, them don't implicate the same aggravating factors as the shooter. So this is why, if there is any dispute in a prosecutor's mind as who the person was that potentially killed the person, it should not be a death penalty case. And if you are not surely convinced that you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt to each and every individual juror, each and every, well, each aggravating factor, at least one aggravating factor that justifies the death penalty beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should not be imposing it. We have a lower standard now with the DeSantis rule, if you will, but as a prosecutor that's tried death penalty cases for the life of me, I don't even understand why this is a death penalty case to begin with. I'm not suggesting that what happened is right. But you have to make a decision as to whether the aggravating factors in the case, for example, vulnerability of individuals, young people, old people, was it done, you know, in a commission of a felony, certainly one of them, was it done as part of terrorism? There's a number of aggravating factors. Are they sufficient enough to go in that direction where you're asking the jury to give the ultimate penalty, and especially in a case where the defense seems to be showing to a juror, jury, he may not have even been the shooter. It's not a good death penalty case. Well, the state says he was the shooter because they have this surveillance video of him getting into the back passenger or back uh, driver's side uh, seat. And so they're saying that these, you know, bullets were fired from there. You know, they're stippling on the victims, meaning at close range that these happened. Uh, there's another question, Terry, I'm going to send to you from uh, Gape or Georgia Peach, I think, GA Peach 198 from Twitter. And this is kind of tough because we heard this testimony last week, but I think it's kind of, uh, you know, confusing to people. Can you explain the trajectory of the bullets in reference to the angle of the bullets in the car? Well, it's interesting because during the opening for the prosecution, she actually did state, listen, don't forget your science that you learned when you were in school. And she admitted it's not going to be foolproof that all of her evidence that she's putting in from a forensic standpoint might not tell you the exact thing that happened. And in fact, when she brought those forensics in and she questioned them, they could not basically state certainly that the trajectory was from that back seat. And here's the reason why. We heard on cross-examination, and I mentioned this before, that we don't know so many of the variables. We don't know how high or how tall the individual was. We don't know where he or she was sitting. We don't know any of the information which could actually give us the trajectory of those bullets. And so they actually had to admit on the stand during cross-examination that essentially it was a guesstimate. So I think it's a very difficult issue. I think that that's a weakness in the prosecution's case, and I think if they can't definitively state how those bullets were shot from that back seat, it's really going to be very difficult to put Melly 
in the box. And that's what they've done right now. I think Bob is absolutely right. They've said, look, Melly was the one with the gun. Melly was the one who shot. He was in the back. You have that, you know, gunshot on close range. And so for those reasons, they decided that he was the one who was the shooter. But it's not that definitive, at least not in my mind, and I think in the minds of those jurors as well. Mm hmm well, it'll be interesting. Uh, Terry, I want to see what you say later in the day about how this jury looks as they're listening to the testimony. I know it's hard to read them, but sometimes they're kind of expressive and you can tell what they're thinking. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. And we are going to take a quick break. So stay with us and keep your questions coming to us on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you're watching Law and Crime. We'll be right back.
Okay, welcome back to Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it for the next two hours. Our trial coverage takes us to Broward County, Florida, for the trial of Jamel Demons, better known by his stage name YNW Melly. The South Florida rapper is charged with two counts of first degree murder for the deaths of his two friends, Christopher Thomas Jr. and Anthony Williams, who are also part of the YNW collaborative, along with Cortland Henry. The co defendant in this case will be tried separately, those cases having been severed. Today, court is off to a late start because of a juror issue, and we're going to recap some of the key moments from Thursday's testimony due to the court being dark on Friday and Monday. And as soon as court starts, of course, you know we're going to jump right into it. So let's listen to the testimony of forensic scientist Tara Hell Shell. And without getting into the actual results, we're just going to orient the jury to the chart that I have here, beginning with the top left. Yes, so the top left is an image kind of showing where the particle is located on the sample, and that is taken at 400 times magnification. And the top right? That is now a closer up image of that particle taken at 3,200 times magnification, where you can see clearly that it is bright, it is round in shape, um, and you kind of are able to visualize really the morphology of that particle. And bottom left? So that is the what is called the EDS spectrum. Basically, it's just showing you what elements are present in that particle. So PB is lead, BA is barium, and SB is antimony. So you see peaks for all of those present in that particle. Therefore, it is a particle that contains lead, barium, and antimony, which makes it characteristic of gunshot residue. And are the peaks that we see uh, consistent with the amount of that c compound within the sample? Yes, overall the height of the peaks relate to how much of that element is in the particle. And finally the bottom right. So that is the image that the instrument takes during the automated analysis. I'm showing you what's been entered into evidence, evidence of states 57. Do you recognize that? I do, yes. And what is that? Uh, this is a gunshot residue kit that we received in this case. <laughs> and do you have, do you uh, analyze states 57? Yes, I did. And did you ultimately analyze state 60? Yes, I did. Okay. So, let me see. scissors. Go ahead and open these things 
speak in Publish State 57. And the contents. So you received one sample, but there are two tubes. Yes. What are they representative of? Um, these were um, samples that we had received that are labeled as coming from the right hand and the left hand. And who's the individual? Uh, Cortland Henry. Did you ultimately have a chance to analyze and go through this SEM process, which is the automated process and your individual process, in order to come up with an agreement as to the presence of GSR? Yes. And what was that? And if you can specify both the left and then the right. Mm -hmm. So the um, right hand of Cortland Henry contained zero particles characteristic of gunshot residue and two, two component particles. And the left hand contained one particle characteristic of gunshot residue and one two component particle. Okay. And can you explain to us what that means? Basically, um, overall, there was gunshot residue present on the hands. Okay, and is it, what affects the presence or absence of GSR on a person's hand or any object? Sure, so if there is gunshot residue on someone's hands, that means that the individual got it on themselves by either discharging a firearm, being in the proximity of a firearm when it was discharged, or by coming into contact with a surface or object with gunshot residue on it. And if we may go back to the demonstrative aid, what was this demonstrative aid? Was this representative of your results of Portland Henry? Yes, that was the particle characteristic of gunshot residue that was on the left hand. And the components, which you explained before, there are three, there are three kinds or three compounds that you were looking for and which compounds were present in Portland Henry's left hand. Lead, barium, and antimony were present in that particle. So all three components? Yes. Okay, and let's move on to state 60, which was the sample for the G. Mm -hmm. What were your results? And again, did you also go through the SEM automated process and then your individual characteristic uh, process? I did, yes. So there were zero particles characteristic of gunshot residue, but at least nine two-component particles. Okay. And what does that mean? <laughs> so um, like I mentioned, two-component particles can come from gunshot residue, but they also have other sources. So because of that, um, these results are basically inconclusive. They could be gunshot residue, but they also could be from something else, and I can't say which it is. Okay. In your analysis and reviewing the sample, did you find anything inconsistent with gunshot residue, if I'm phrasing that correctly? Correct, and I did not. So overall, with two component particles, or any of the particles we look at, if they, oftentimes, if the particles are from another source, there are other elements or amounts of elements that would be unusual to find in gunshot residue. So, for example, one common source of two component particles is brake pads. Brake pads typically contain high amounts of the element iron. So, if I'm doing my analysis and I come across particles with high amounts of iron, I eliminate them and I do not report them because there's something about them that would suggest they're from something else. So, while I still cannot call these particles gunshot residue, there was nothing about those particles that were unusual. Are you familiar with them in the animal? I am, yes. Are you familiar with the friend or foe presumptive GSR kit? I am. What is that kit testing? That kit is looking, is a, like you said, a presumptive test that is looking for the presence of nitrates, so nitrogen containing compounds. Okay. So, for instance, these GSR kits are made to, um, essentially alert to the presence of a, a certain compound. Yes. And the friend or foe kit specifically alerts to the compound of nit nitrogen particles. Yes. So the presence or absence of nitrogen particles. Correct. And are presumptive tests relied on exclusively? No, they are just a screening 
Um, like I mentioned, they're looking for nitrates, and there are many things that can um, contain nitrates. Um, so they are not conclusive the presence of gunshot residue or gunpowder. They are um, really just the it's a screening tool. Okay, well, welcome back. I still have Brian Buckmeyer in studio with me. You know, what can I say? He's just uh, everything extraordinary at the Law and Crime Network. So it's great to have my friend here as well. It's Natalie Whittingham Burrell, uh, who is a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, and I'm being told, I'm looking at the producer says here, known as, and it, this is what I'm being told you're known as. This is not what I am saying. Let's be Brian, let's be clear for the record here, that you are referred to as the lot, lawyer chick on YouTube. Is, is that right? Is that what you refer to yourself as? Yes, so I will not be offended. Here on YouTube, I am known as Natalie Lawyer Chick. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't want to step into anything here, but anyway, that's great for you because I, I hear that. You're awesome, and I, I'm glad that you're here on the show. Natalie, uh, let's look. This testimony as a prosecutor, still to this day, all these years later, makes me want to faint. I get nervous. You have to put it in. It's important to the case. You don't want to lose the jury. So rather than talk about the ins and outs of the perfunctory part of admitting your evidence in, which is a skill set you have to learn as a prosecutor, what are your thoughts about the trial overall, where it's going? What are you seeing? Well, from the perspective of a defense attorney, I know that jurors treat forensic evidence <coughs> very, very seriously, and the presence or lack of it can be detrimental to a prosecutor. case. That does not mean that a, a state cannot win their case without that forensic evidence. And here, they just don't have the forensic evidence to back up, up their case. What they have is YNW Melly in the back seat, even according to his girlfriend's mother, and phone records placing him there when the shooting is alleged to have occurred. That's their best evidence. But this uh, gunshot residue being found on YNW Bortland's hands is more helpful to YNW Melly than it isn't. The same thing with the ballistics evidence. It was more helpful to YNW Melly than it was not helpful to to him. Wow, a, a, a great point, Brian. We were talking with Ann Jeanette before, and, and I want to get into this because I think it's so important. They're talking about the motive, and, and I, I, I I hate when, and it's true, you, the prosecution does not have to prove motive, but you sure want it as a prosecutor, and a defense attorney is sure going to say, what would cause him to do this? Now, we're talking about aggravating factors, Brian, we talked about it before, and I heard that there's a dispute. It could be maybe it was over a financial thing, assuming you want to believe the state's theory of the case. Maybe it's gang-related. First of all, where, Brian, is the evidence of the gang-related aspect of it? It's just a, another wild I'll throw it out there because this is really important because the gang relation is one of the aggravating factors for the death penalty case, Brian. Yeah, so first of all, understand when I answer these questions, what I am. I'm a former public defender from Brooklyn, not from Brooklyn, but practice in Brooklyn. And so what I see oftentimes in cases like this, unless you're going to get that smoking gun of my clients in a gang and watch him do gang stuff and look at this video of him acknowledging that he's in a gang, they're just gonna throw circumstance and the typical tropes. Look at his face. He has tattoos. Look at the way he raps. Look at the way he holds himself. Clearly he must be in a gang. But there's no, unlike what my grandfather, my mom probably says, guilt by association. You have to actually participate in the gang. You can't just go on a social media or, or go on a rap video and say, hey, I'm a part of this crew. Or, hey, I'm a part of this crew. 
hey, you can even be part of that crew, but if you're not doing anything gang related, the enhancement doesn't seem to work there. And here we have a case where no one's quite sure what it is. Is it money motivated? Is it gang motivated? Maybe he isn't a gang, but this was his day off. I don't know, but I don't know, I guess they get days off. We get days off as attorneys. I assume you get days off on gangs. You can't be gang banging every day, but if there's no evidence and there's just this pomp and circumstance of, look at his face, look at his tattoos, he says he is a gang, this must be gang related because someone died around him, I don't see the aggravating circumstances. Yeah, and, and Natalie, I, I go, go to the point, and I think that this is, a, this is not a liberal concept. This is from a person who's tried death penalty cases as a prosecutor. I want to be absolutely convinced who the shooter is in a case like this, and I want to be absolutely convinced as to what the motive is, because with all respect to the judges and the defense lawyers and the prosecutors, the system is not infallible, and I think in the end as a prosecutor, tactically, the defense is going to jam this down the prosecutor's throat in summation to say they're just throwing the spaghetti against the wall and hoping something sticks and then they ask you to convict him of capital murder for that? I mean, I, you talk to me. What, what are your thoughts as a defense lawyer? Because this is one where I think they can really get outraged about. Yeah, as a defense lawyer, I always anticipate where the state doesn't have a motive. And I know that uh, in closing, the state's going to hammer home that they don't even have to prove a motive in order to prove their case. But we know juries and we know real life people. And they're going to want to know why. Why did this happen? And so far, there's been no evidence of a why. If you believe that YNW Melly isn't a gang, then you must also believe that YNW Sack Chaser and the other gentlemen were also in the same gang. What type of conflict was there in order for this uh, alleged murder or hit to be ordered or carried out by YNW Melly? There's just no evidence of it so far. And as you said, in a death penalty case, the jury's really going to want to see the proof. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's not just so much showing what the motive is, i.e. if they want to prove it's gangs, it's just show it's not any other motive. At least that's what I would do as a prosecutor. Anyway, now let's take a listen to the cross-examination and a bit of the redirect. You got the sample from the sample from Miramar Police Department? Yes. Specifically, uh, Detective Moretti directed <clears throat> to you? Yes. And when we talk about GSR, our gunshot residue, uh, you're aware that GSR can be found on clothes, right? Yes, that's possible. Did Detective Moretti send you any clothes of Cortland Henry? He did not. He didn't send you any of the clothes? No. Did you know that the clothes of Cortland Henry were collected by the Miramar Ob Police Department? Objection, cause of speculation outside the scope of the crime. Well, I know the cause of speculation. She knows she can answer the question. Mm -hmm. Were you aware that? The Miramar Police Department collected Portland Henry's clothes? No, I was not aware of that. In your examination, had you received clothes, you could test those clothes for GSR, correct? Yes, we can and certainly you, test clothing. And you've done that many times, correct? Yes, absolutely. Also, uh, if someone is in a hospital, in a bed in a hospital, do you know if that person has washed their hands? I don't. Okay. And by washing your hands, you can get rid of GSR, correct? Yes, hand washing can remove most of my, all of the particles on someone's hands. Do you know if Cortland Henry uh, washed his hands or changed his clothes? I don't know that. Is hand washing the only thing, contrary to popular belief, that removes gunshot residue? No, gunshot residue is um, easily removed in general. So with respect to the hands, um, any type of activity, touching or use of the hands can remove particles pretty easily. Uh, with clothing, any activity. Um, so if the garment is touching things, um, if it's laundered. If it's um, removed? Yes, any activity can cause particles to be disrupted or removed. And you're an independent lab, correct? Yes, we are. You're not associated with Miramar Police Department? Correct, we are not. You're not associated with the Broward Sheriff's Office? We are not. So you can only test what you're submitted, correct? Correct. Nothing further. One question. Yes, 
you were hired by the Miramar Police Department to perform this test, then, correct? Yes, they're the ones that submitted the samples. You can only test what was submitted. On that note, we're going to take a break. We'll talk about it on the other end. Please stay with us.
Turns out to be why, and we're completely thrown off at the beginning of the case. But I have a moral responsibility when I get in there that I know, no matter how hard the evidence is, that this is the person who did it, and we have done everything to check to see if it was anyone else, and to build up that case so that all threads were tied up, if for no other reason that you don't have what the defense attorney did right here with this forensic expert to show that you were malfeasance. The more malfeasance there is, the less confidence the jury has. What are your thoughts? So exactly right. And as the defense attorney, I'm looking for every single opening that you're going to give me. And there are a lot of openings here in the forensic evidence. There were even openings with their civilian witness, the mother of the girlfriend. There were openings all over the place and YNW Melly's attorneys are highly skilled. And so they got right into those openings and pointed out all of the inconsistencies, all of the ways in which the evidence is missing and lacking. And that was only cross-examination. Wait until they get to closing arguments and they're able to point out every single opening that was left by the state. All of those openings are reasonable doubt. Um, at least that will be the defense's argument. Does that get them over the finish lines to not guilty or a hung verdict? I don't know. But I do know that it seems like the prosecution left a lot to be desired here so far. Well, you definitely know things. My producer said you were rather prescient. And in fact, during the course of your answer, you proved that because Felicia Holmes... Shout out to my man Terrell Burton's man. Keep rocking, man. The mother of the defendant's ex-girlfriend, which you just mentioned, took the stand on Thursday. And there was never a dull moment for sure. Let's take a listen as to why. Good morning, Ms. Holmes. Good morning. How are you today? Not good. Are you cold? No, I'm just, um, you know, I just feel, I don't feel comfortable. Are you nervous? I feel threatened. So, Ms. Holmes, I want to start and just talk about who you are. Yes. Ms. Holmes, do you have any children? Yes, I do. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who is Mariah Hamilton? My name is daughter. And how old is Mariah? She's 22 right now. And Mariah, did she have a romantic relationship with someone named Jamel Dennis, also known as Ryan W. Mel? Yes, she did. When was she involved in that romantic relationship with Mel? Um, I, I think it may be 2016 or so to maybe 2019, 20. Okay. Did you have the opportunity to meet Mr. Dennis? Yes, I did. What did you refer to him as? Um, I call him Janelle Melly. Do you see him here in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Where is he? He's right here. And what's he wearing? Uh, a white turtleneck and a gray jacket. You are made of record reflected in the court identification of the defendant? Yes, the record will, will reflect the court identification of the defendant. Okay. So I want to go back to October 26th of 2018. Where were you living? I was living in Coco. And my geography is terrible, I think. How far away is Coco from Broward County? About three, four hours. What do you do for a living? I'm a registered nurse. Were you a registered nurse at that time as well? Yes, I was. Did you know the defendant's mother? Yes, I did. And who is she? Jane. Have you met her prior to October 26th of 2018? Um, yes, I did. Have you communicated with her? Yes, I did. Did you have a phone number for her? Um, I'm pretty sure I probably did. I'm not asking you to I don't know. I did not. I can't remember. Okay. So I'm going to go forward on October 26th of 2018 and talk about that early morning hours. Did you receive or hear a phone call or a FaceTime video call in which the defendant was a participant? Um, I did overhear. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly the, the context of the call, but I did overhear um, the, phone, the phone call. Right. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what woke you up that morning. Um, just hearing my daughter's voice. Okay. What was she? Was she what was the tone of her voice without saying what she said? Um, I don't. I don't remember. It was. I don't remember. Okay. Do you remember anything the defendant said on that video? Um, not really, no, I don't. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to read the statement you gave in 2018? Um, I read the statement. Okay. Was it I don't recall, I don't remember anything from that statement, but I do remember my deposition from okay. December 22. So your, the, the deposition, that would have been six months ago? Yes. Okay. 
I want to go and when you spoke, you remember speaking with law enforcement in December of 2018? I remember speaking with them, but I couldn't. I don't remember what they look like. I don't remember their names, mm -hmm. but I do remember talking to someone. Okay, so Miss Holmes, I want to ask you: Were you honest and truthful with law enforcement when you spoke with them? I, I would hope so. I mean, it was, it was 2018. I was I went through a lot in that year, so I'm not sure where my, my mindset was at that time. Did you lie to law enforcement? I would hope not. I don't remember. I don't remember my. I don't remember my, what I said that it was like five years ago. Oh, of course, of course. I understand. It's been a long time. So, in terms of the time frame, that was closer in time to the incident. What October twenty sixth of two thousand and eighteen? Um, if that's where you guys are saying it is. You don't even remember. I don't remember. I said two thousand eighteen was a very hard year for me. My husband just went to prison. I, my father died. I had a lot going on, so I was really out of it. Okay. And in terms of your conversations with the police officers that morning? Yes. I do remember that they kind of bullied me and threatened my daughter to okay. take her to jail for accessory after that. I do remember that. Yes. And in terms of the statements that you made about what happened, yeah. you don't have any recollection of that. Did you read this statement multiple times? I, I looked at it and I just didn't recall it and I, yeah, I don't know. Okay. And so you indicated you hoped you were truthful with law enforcement. Yes, I did. I have to ask you to be more definitive. Were you truthful? I don't remember what I said to them back then. So if I was to tell you something now, I could be lying. I don't want to lie on the stand because you won't take me to jail. So I'm saying what you want me to say. I do not want you to say anything. I want you to tell the truth. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Okay. So Ms. Holmes, with regards to that day, mm -hmm. did you lie to law enforcement? I just asked the answer. Ms. Holmes, did you ever say the defendant made you quit your job? I don't know who was saying that. I don't know who's ever made me quit my job. Objection. Ooh. If I may approach you. I'm going to share this next few minutes. So I'm going to ask you again, have you ever made a statement that the defendant made you quit your job and that they would take care of us until the trial was over? Objection. I don't say anything like that. Okay. So you're denying making that statement? I don't say anything like that. No. Objection. Your Honor, can I just have a standard yes. objection so we don't keep interrupting? No, you're any. You stay with your own standing objection. <laughs> Whatever defense it is. Okay. No. So, Ms. Holmes, in terms of the have you ever said a statement to the have you ever made a statement to the effect of you were told to quit your job and the defense would take care of us? Of the judge. No. Excuse me. The defense? No. Yeah. Which comes up? Tell me about the phone that I ask you. Did your daughter tell you? Did you have a conversation with your daughter about what happened on October 26th of 2018? Yes, I asked her if she knew what happened. Oh. Did she tell you what happened? Without her? No, she didn't. Just she didn't know. Have you dated her? That is different than that. Your Honor, we'd object to the lack of foundation, calls for hearsay, speculation, unless they can establish that that witness was present. Thank you. Uh, objection noted. Uh, that's why I previously ruled on sidebar. Proceed. When you first took the stand, you said, I feel threatened. Yes, sir, I do. Who do you feel threatened the by? Christine. Christine Bradley, the prosecutor. This prosecutor? Yes, I do. Thank you. Well, wow, I don't know who's more angry, the witness or the defense attorney on that one, but we're going to talk about it with our awesome guests on the other end. Take a break. Please stay with us. did get an update from uh, the juror who was in the hospital this morning, and uh, my understanding is uh, she will be joining us. Uh, everything was just, I guess, uh, issued dehydration or something along those lines, but I'm told she will be here. Uh, you hear me, all right? Uh, one thing, though, I need to, to bring to your attention is uh, what we broke this morning, one of our jurors uh, has... Uh, Gary was escorting the jurors out. Uh, he was approached, uh, and uh, one of the jurors had asked him a question. Gary, go ahead. You want to tell us exactly what was said? And by yes. She, uh, she more or less, she said, asked me if she could ask me a question. I said, well, it depends. 
So the question was, she said, well, what's the status of the mistrial? Mm -hmm. So now, I don't know what you want me to do about that, but that's the question that was posed. <coughs> Judge Rainey, have her name on the record and find out how she would have any knowledge of that because that was never stated in front of them. I think it was. I think it was a. Uh, it was done on the record by Mr. Howard the other day. Is Mr. Howard here? No. No, he's not. Oh, I apologize. I thought we were all here. All he's coming time. right now, Judge. Mr. Howard, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. I heard it all inside the media room. So uh, no apology necessary. Thank you. Apologize for not being present. No, it's my fault. I thought I mean, uh, Gary walked in, but uh, what he was advising me and I to, uh, to the attorneys was that uh, there was a comment by one of the jurors. Did you hear that? Yes. Uh, so uh, I don't know exactly what you want me to do. Who uh, the juror was? That was Miss Manuel. Miss Manuel. Uh, so, one of the things that is, uh, you know, my recollection, and I could be wrong, is different than yours, Ms. Bradley. My recollection is that uh, uh, there was a motion for mistrial that was made out out loud, and, and Mr. Howard came sidebar. Uh, but the jurors been instructed not to read anything about the case. So I don't know if there's something in the newspaper about that that's a different story, but I don't know what you want me to do, if anything. I bring it to your attention. Anything, any real interaction that Gary has with them, something that may seem inappropriate, we always bring it up and let you know. And, and should I assume that for future reference, you'd rather I make those motions outside the presence of the jury? Uh, just come sign. Okay. But um, that was my re is my recollection. You, you, you yes. Is, I thought you was, at one point. I don't know which. There was two motions for mistrial. I don't know which at which point. But I believe at at least one point you stood up and said, I have a motion for mistrial. Right. No, actually, there was a question asked. I said, objection, move for mistrial. And no, called the sidebar and asked me to hold it until the end. And then at the end, after the jury left, uh, Mr. Adelstein and I articulated motions for mistrial on an independent basis. And uh, that's, how it trend, that's how it went down. But it was announced in open court, correct? Um, I said, objection, move for mistrial. You That's my side. recollection. I remember coming sidebar, and there being that being said in sidebar. I don't recall it being said in open court. I thought it was said in open court. It's a fact that I, I said it. So, again, that's, I don't know what you want me to do, if anything. And, uh, you know, the jurors, uh, is that juror here, by the way? Uh, there, she's in the reception area. So, anyway. I leave to your discretion. Uh, it was announced in open court there, there was a mis motion for mistrial. Uh, Gary obviously didn't answer the question. And, uh, what did you respond, Gary? I just I told her I didn't know anything about that. And then she asked me, weren't you there? I said, I, I don't remember that. Anyway, that's where we're at. So if you think it over, let me know if there's any inquiry you want me to, to make. Madam, say yeah, I think both you me. need to. State's position would be that she needs to be brought in. Your Honor needs to inquire if she's saying anything in the media or any coverage of that, because that was discussed online, is my understanding. What do you think, Counsel? Well, to the extent that the court's inquiry of this jury can, is because of the state's faulty recollection that I didn't say move for mistrial in front of the jury, I know that not to be the case. I did say objection, move for a mistrial. You then called a sidebar, and the only thing you said was, please reserve that to me. That's my recollection. Yeah, that's what I mean. Again, um, is, is that what you're concerned about, or, or is it concerned about just because it was said that you think I ought to inquire? Yeah, I think that defense is general. If we go forward, and if they're going to waive any inquiry of this witness, if she's been looking at any of the other items or anything online that the defense brought to your honor's attention earlier because if they thought was laboring under the impression that there was some sort of cessation of trial and then started looking at media and news reports because they thought their jury service was over that would be a problem better to have more information than less so we uh 
We have no objection to that being the procedure that we deploy. So you want me to bring her in? Indicate to her that uh, I was advised by our bailiff, Gary, that you asked him about a motion for mistrial and what had happened, and, uh, and just ask her uh, how is it that you're, uh, you're concerned about that or, or where did you hear about it, and uh, just find out what information she's got and uh, about it and where she heard it from. Is that the end of the inquiry? I would ask that you inquire from her if she conveyed any of that to any of the other jurors. Anything else? No. Unless the court wants to say, unfortunately, I did not it. <laughs> so we're going to ask uh, what she heard, where she, where she learned it from. If she did any outside research afterwards. And if she inquired or uh, asked any of the other jurors concerning that topic. Anything else that you want me to ask, counsel? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else, David? Nothing, sir. All right. Do favor? You went together. Hey, Ms. Manuel, thanks for coming back in. Uh, let the record reflect the first of the defendant, his counsel, the assistant state attorneys, as well as one of our jurors, Ms. Manuel. Counsel, please be seated. Ms. Manuel, please be seated. Ms. Manuel, uh, why I broke in is uh, my bailiff uh, indicated to me that uh, when you were weren't able to uh, start this morning, that he was escorting the jurors out, and you approached him and asked him about uh, what happened with the mistrial or something to this effect. Uh, is that right? So that's a yes. All right. So uh, I guess my concern is uh, what you may have heard uh, about this uh, alleged mistrial and where you heard it from. 
who the last day I was here, and the defense attorney said, jumped up and said, we Okay. So that's where you heard from? Yes. Anything other than that? No. Uh, it, was there any other um, research that you may have done or looked at newspapers or any kind of article about the uh, motion for mistrial, anything like that? No. Anything on the news, any news media? No. About the mistrial, no. And uh, last but not least, uh, did you speak with any of the other jurors about the, the motion for mistrial? No, when Gary came in and asked us this morning, do we have any issues, any questions? And I didn't want to ask him in front of everybody, so I waited until we got in the hall and I put him inside and asked him that. Because he asked him, he had any concerns. Okay. All right. Okay, that's what we're trying to clear up and find out. Because there's a, a admission that we, I say every time we break, don't discuss the case, don't form any opinion about well, the case. Well, said in here. That's what we're trying to find out. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let the record reflect the juror stepped out. Counsel remain on the phone. Any other issues regarding this issue with Ms. Manuel? No, sir. Okay. So uh, we'll otherwise ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Juror shows up. Yes. I think, are they all here? Uh, as far as I know, no. Okay. So see if they're all here. If they're all here, we'll, we'll start. Yeah, he did say we're short two or three. 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 But they're here now? They're all here. All right, they're all here now.
Please be seated. The board of the Cameron Clark is present to the board. His counsel, the assistant city attorneys, and his close lady, the governor. Then you don't uh, start the late start. Hopefully everybody's all right. Uh, and, uh, we appreciate your patience. We also appreciate the fact that you're all here. And we thank you. Uh, but we're ready to begin again. Uh, when we left off last week, the state was still on its case in chief. Uh, Madam, who's your next witness? Susan Johnson of T-Mobile. Susan Johnson, please. Susan Johnson, please. Susan Johnson? Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. What I'd like to do is to raise your right hand for us. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you state your full legal name for the record? Susan Johnson. Do you spell your first and last name for the court reporter? S-U-S-A-N-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Please have a seat. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, that microphone in front of you will adjust up or down, but not back and forth. Okay? Thank you. Are you ready to proceed, ma'am? Yes, sir. Counsel, you may. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Johnson. How are you today? Good, thank you. Could you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and tell them where you work? Sure. My name is Susan Johnson, and I work for T-Mobile. How long have you worked for T-Mobile? A uh, total of 26 years. And what do you do for T-Mobile? I am a manager within the Legal Respons Emergency Response Unit. Prior to working for T-Mobile, did you work for any other telecommunications companies? Yes, I did. And what were those? Uh, AT&T Wireless. And how long did you work for AT&T? Five years. How long in total have you worked in the telecommunications industry? Uh, 31 years. So you indicated you were part of the manager of the emergency response? Legal emergency response. And what does that mean? That means that we respond to subpoenas and other legal demands from various agencies across the United States. And when you say a legal demand, what would you mean by that? A uh, subpoena or a court order, search warrant. In terms of the records when you work with them, how often do you work with them? Every day. What do you do with the records? Uh, so we're able to retrieve the information from our secured computer database. Uh, and then send the response back to the agency that's requesting. And I know this might sound silly, but what type of company is T-Mobile? We're a wireless telephone carrier. And is T-Mobile the parent company of any other wireless carriers? Uh, we did acquire Sprint. Okay. How long has T-Mobile been the parent company for Sprint? Uh, April 1st, 2020 is when we acquired them. In terms of the information that is kept by T-Mobile, do you keep phone call records? Yes. What would you call those? Call detail records. Do you keep information regarding the networks? Yes. Do you keep information regarding subscribers? Yes. What type of information is kept in a call detail record? So call detail reports will show incoming and outgoing phone calls or text messages made or received by the cellular telephone. Does T-Mobile keep that information as to when data is used? Yes. Will a data phone call or video call show up in call detail records? No. Does the information show for who is being called? Yes, it will show the uh, transaction of the outbound or inbound phone call on the call detail records. 
T-Mobile will keep the cell site information for the call that the outgoing non-T-Mobile subscriber. Sure. What's the purpose of collecting this information at T-Mobile? Uh, billing purposes. Um, is there any consideration as to the health and optimization of the network? So we keep uh, what is known as timing advanced records, um, which is solely for engineering uh, purposes, so that they are able to check up on the network, yes. When a phone call is made from a cellular device or handset, can you describe from the network perspective how, what happens? Sure. So what happens is the phone reaches out to the tower with the strongest signal, which is not necessarily the closest tower. So for example, we can have a tower on top of the building, or we can have one down the street. However, the one down the street might be the stronger signal and would pick up that call. At that point, it's transferred to our switch, and our switch is what records all the information that you will see on the call detail records. At that point, it's then transferred to a landline company, and it's the landline company that actually delivers the call. So you mentioned true call data. What is that? So true call data is um, for the network. It um, will show where the phone is connected to when it's not in use, as long as it's turned on. Does Sprint also have a similar type of data? Yes. What is per call measurement data? Correct. Is that the same for true call for the Sprint analogy? Correct, that's Sprint's term. In terms of subscriber information, what types of subscriber information is kept? So the subscriber information, we have two types. Um, one would be a prepay, uh, and then the other would be a monthly account. So the prepay, what type of information could you have? So prepay, a customer is not required to provide their information, um, but they could provide a name, address, and date of birth. On the postpaid or the build type, what type of information do you have? So we would have the name, uh, the address, date of birth, social security number, and we actually do a credit check on that individual. In terms of the individual using the specific phones or handsets, can you testify to that? No. How many times have you testified in court before? Uh, over a thousand times. Were you, as the record custodian for T-Mobile, provided legal process, I'm going to go through them one by one, under reference tracking number for T-Mobile, 214-6318, for two phone numbers of 305-922-9533 and 954-376-9158? Yes. As the T-Mobile records custodian under tracking number... 2192645, where you provided records and requests and legal process for three phone numbers 561 720 3210, 772 713 9807, and 954 376 9158. Yes. As the records custodian for T Mobile and your T Mobile tracking ID 281851 where you submitted a request for nine, phone number 954-248-9081. Yes. For T-Mobile tracking number 217-2715, for phone number 954-376-9158, where you provided a legal process to obtain the records for that issue. Yes. <clears throat> were you also under tracking number 205-8127, Provide asked to provide for legal process phone number records for 772-713-9807. Yes. Was Sprint at the time part now part of T-Mobile under the phone numbers for 772-713-2341 and 954-371-7895 under Sprint tracking number 2018-221418 provided legal process and requested to provide records. Yes. Was Sprint under case, Sprint case number 2019-15821 asked to provide records with regards to phone number 225-529-5054? Yes. Prior to coming into court today, did you have the opportunity to review the records that were provided? Yes, I did. Are these records made at or about the time 
They are created by a person with knowledge? Yes. Are they kept in the regular course of business of Sprint and T-Mobile? Yes, they are. Okay. Is it in the regular practice to keep such records? Yes. You're at this time approaching with what's been labeled as states OOO for identification purposes and previously shown to defense. <coughs> Ms. Johnson, do you recognize this USB? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? Uh, my initials in today's date are on the uh, USB. And does those USB fairly and accurately represent the records that were provided by T-Mobile in response to the tracking numbers that we just discussed, as well as to Sprint and the tracking numbers and case numbers they just provided? Yes. Here at this time, the state would offer at state triple O, a state 63. Any objection? Yes, judge. Objection. Relevance. Sure, why don't you come side <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, objection go rules, it will be admitted. What's the next number? 63. 63 notes. Permission to publish? You may. I'm sorry, I didn't get you. 
63. So I'm going to start with the sprint records. What are we looking at in this particular file? 2018-221418-6155597. This would be the subscriber information. And in terms of looking at this particular one, I'm going to zoom in. What is the billing name for this? Chris Thomas. <laughs> and going to the second one, what is the billing name on this one? Uh, the first name is D-O-N-T-A-V-I-U-S. Last name is Withers, W-I-T-H-E-R-S. At the top of this screen capture, there's a BAN number. Do you know what that means? Yes. What is that? That would be the account number. Does that correlate with the other data that's been provided? Yes. Going to now the same Word document file name. What are we looking at in this sprint document? Uh, this is also subscriber information. So you had mentioned that billing account number, that BAN number? Correct. If you can touch the screen in front of you, it, it, that can you can write on it and it will show up on the screen for the jurors. So if you could point out where the billing account number is here. Okay. And then what is the phone number that was being used by this account or the subject number? 772-713-2341. And is this again for that Chris Thomas billing account? Yes. Okay. Scrolling down to the next billing account number. Is this the other account that was we just looked at the subscriber information on for Dontavious Withers? Yes. And what is the phone number that's associated with this particular account? 954-371-7895. Going on to 2019-1582106566861. For the phone number in question on this particular record, is that labeled right here? Yes. And what phone number is that? 225-529-5054. And looking at the Microsoft Excel viewer, can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what we're looking at here? Uh, these are the call detail records with cell site information for spread. Going over to the T-Mobile records. Just for demonstrative and illustrative purposes, when you are looking this particular one called Timing Advance LTE and UMTS underscore TN 772-713-9807. Then it has another underscore IMSI. What is an IMSI? That stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identity Number, which is the number that's associated with the SIM card found in the back of the phone. And the first, the 772-713-9807, what is that? That would be the phone number. Are all of these records provided by T-Mobile? Yes. In terms of completion codes, is that something that is reflected in these records? Yes. What is a completed successfully completion code? So that means that the call uh, went through the network successfully. What is an abnormal completion? 
An abnormal completion means the call did not go through. Perhaps the user hung up prior to the call connecting or a dropped call. Okay. In terms of what time frame are all of these records kept in? Uh, we keep them in uh, UTC time, which is coordinated universal time. So depending on what time of the year it is, you would have to subtract either four or five hours from the time that you see reflected in order to arrive at East Coast time. On October 26th of 2018, how many hours did you have to subtract? It would be minus four. The cell site locations indicate latitude and longitude of the cell site. Is that the, now there's also a physical address. Is the physical address always the same as the latitude and longitude? No. Yeah. What could the physical address sometimes show? So but that's what we refer to as an administrative address. Um, so we use that for 911 purposes. To get the exact location of the cell tower, you would take the two coordinates, the latitude and longitude, plot it into a mapping program such as Google Earth, and that would be the exact location. Is there any cross examination? One second, Jim. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. Thank you. So, the technology that you um, just described um, for identifying locations. How, how is that verified? By, by Timor.
that you would have to ask an engineer for. So you don't know how that's done? How it's verified? Yeah. As to what tower connected to? Is that what you're asking? Yes. So it's done with a radio frequency is how the towers work. It's a signal. Okay. So but you were telling us earlier that the phone does not necessarily connect to the nearest tower. Correct. It connects to the tower with the strongest signal. Correct. So how is it that you know to approximate, how, how do you know how far the phone is from the actual tower? I don't. Is there no way to tell that? No. Not through me. Not through you? Correct. I don't know why my shit keeps sticking, but it's cool. I'm about to try to start it over, y'all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Are you John Denzel? I am, sir. Welcome. Come on up here, sir. That's our witness stand. When you get there, you put your things down. You bring your right hand each one. When you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you should give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. This is your full legal name for the record. Jonathan Denzel. This is Zingy. This is Zingy LLP. Spell your first name as well, sir. J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. Thank you. Imagine what's gonna happen when, Mel when um, Bortland get on trial, get on the stand. Under that microphone, we'll just up or down, but not back up. Counsel, if you're ready, you may proceed. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Can we approach? Very good. Sure. Sure. Said, nigga, you ain't finna scream all this time.
and this sound going out, that's them. They said no sound. They don't want us to hear what's being said. You know, bear with them, I guess. Cause I ain't say nothing, baby. <laughs> what up, Lena? Um, hey, 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 they stopping this shit. They say courses in the sidebar, no sound. So they got they cut the sign off. So don't think it's me. I ain't say nothing for you to hear, Lena. People think, watch this shit just get started. You gonna see how much shit they got on that boy? It's a lot, a whole lot. Y'all can't hear me now. 40 Black, what it do? Can y'all hear me? Yes, no. Hey, Lena. Y'all had to sound off. I was, I'm just sitting here watching this shit. This shit is a circus show. Could y'all hear me, yes or no? Okay, because I had the mic off. I, I wasn't trying to be heard. I was just sitting here watching it with y'all. What up, 40 Black? How you doing, my brother? Free money. What it do? What it do? What it do? Do, do, Hey, Vu. How are you? They don't want us to hear what's being said. Tell us, nigga. We could take it. It's money could take it is the problem. Like, like, look, let me show you. 
this shit is going. So, so, so why the screen just stopping, but not this here? This shit, this here is going. They say you can't hear the sound. It's on a sound, a sidebar, whatever that is. Hey, y'all, just, let's just send prayers up for Melly. Because when Melly finished with this here trial, he got a whole murder trial to go against again for killing the cop. They said one of them killed the cop. And they doing the same thing. Ain't nobody saying nothing. But you ain't going to kill no cop and get over with it, buddy. Hey, Molly officially been chopped in school. Mm-hmm. Melly is officially chopped in school, y'all. You're gonna talk some free Melly. Oh, he finna beat this here. He having a mistrial. You can tell you some dumbass people on, on, in these comments down here. Look. Well, all of them going to be in jail together. At least you have some company. At least Mel's a high. Mel, Melly, and Melvin, they all be in jail together. Well, I'm going to go out. Five. Right. over a little bit. Four. What's the next number? Six people. Thank you. So, Detective Zeller, can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what an extraction does? So, the, 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 the extraction consists or is done in order to obtain whatever is on that phone and to put it in a, a legible or a readable report that's easy for someone to, to look at. And some of the things that you will get also by doing that, you may get items that have been deleted, and uh, so on and so forth. And that's why we do those types of extractions. Nothing further from this witness, Your Honor. Any cross examination? Yes, just briefly. How Good. are you, sir? Good news, sir. You said you did a phone dump here of, of a particular unit that the state referred to. That's correct. And you have not analyzed it? No. You don't know if there's any relevant evidence on it at all? That's correct. Okay. Um, and you don't know who it belongs to, do you? I do know who it belongs to. Uh, obviously, I'm in the office. I, can, I know who it belongs to, but uh, as far as the contents of it, I don't know. You don't know, you don't know who uses it? I do not. You don't know who it's registered to? I do not. Okay. Okay. And as to any contents of that phone, you don't know if they're texts who authored them? Once again, I don't know the contents of it. Okay. okay Your Honor, um, we'd like to come sidebar if you would just truly. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like Charles White said, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm cutting, I'm cutting my volume off because I don't really got nothing to say. I just want to watch and see. They keep on going to the sidebar, y'all. So if y'all don't hear no sound on the, on, on the screen, that's them doing that. Look at the red thing with it saying. He's done. He's officially chopped and screwed. Trust me. Officially. Yeah, that's them doing this. They say court is in a sidebar. That means that, I don't know, they said no sound. They don't want us to hear everything. They're not going to let us hear everything.
Well, well, why they doing that? Let me show y'all something. Why they doing that? We gonna do this. We're here when they come back. They're on the sidebar right now, which means they're not gonna let us hear the whole, the whole nitty gritty of the case and yada yada yada. Thank anybody who joined the mother. Bowie is a fucking special kind of guy, man. I, I, you know what? When I first seen him, and, and and I heard him speak and all that, I was like, this motherfucker is retarded. Then I heard his mother speak. I said, damn, she retarded too. <laughs> Somebody told me I shouldn't be disrespecting his mama. I disrespect your mama too. Fuck you talking about? You know who I am? My name is Mr. I don't give a damn. That's my new name. My name is my new name is Mr. I don't give a damn. So don't ever try to in your life come for me. Cause my credentials speaks for themselves. Rest in peace to Big Pokey. They said that the Titanic tourist submarine. Huh. Look, let me show y'all something, man. While we wait for that to come on. Melly fucked up, man. I feel bad for that young man. I feel real bad for that young man. But look, 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 check this out. Watch this here. Now that I wanna leave, she's crying her heart to me. How could they let this be? I just need time to see. My name is Mr. I don't give a fuck. Check it up, so check it out now, man. Now, sorry for the lack of videos. My voice fucked up, but it's all good. I gotta get this one out. Now, ladies and gentlemen, YNW Melly might be a goddamn serial killer, bruh. Now, He's already charged with a double murder. Okay, they're accusing him from being in the back seat with his three other friends, and he shot two niggas point blank range, then came up with a bright idea of saying, let's stage this at his drive-by, except this thing you never watch a episode of goddamn CSI Miami. Okay, now they got the whole thing yeah, this shit. already written down, and I'll do another video to get into some of that evidence. And by the way, I love this guy's music, okay? I hope these things aren't true, but the percentage of, of opportunity or chance that I believe it ain't true or believe he's completely innocent and he's just going to beat the case and he's going to be out next week is dwindling. In reality, man, this thing ain't coming on for a long time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he's actually accused of doing another murder that we ain't even hear about yet. Apparently, the cops are now investigating him for killing a police officer. Yes, this would be the third goddamn murder. Now, they're saying that this happened before the murder that he's actually locked up on now, but they're saying what happened is him and his friends were present and shooting at a bunch of niggas, right, when a stray bullet hit a police officer like two blocks away. Okay, that police officer died, and if you don't know nothing about the police, they go hard for the police. So, that's all I gotta say. Fuck it. You officially being chopped and screwed. Boo boo. Think that shit is a game? Reliability of the technology as a predicate to the admission of that. So that is our number one foundation argument. Your case that you want me to read? Yes, sir. I'm happy to take a look at it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Here, I first start with citing back to State versus Maximus, which is a 1967 case, which was the earliest time in which I could find a pedometer being mentioned. And at that point, it's important to note this is a well-established technology that's been in use for hundreds of years initially done by train conductors to measure out distances. It's also allowed under the Florida statutes 
and used to be used to measure up distances for determination at a thousand feet from a place of worship, a school, or anything else for measuring distances for enhancement on drug penalties. So I'd start by hanging that one, Your Honor. Then I also have State v. Birch, which is a Wisconsin case in which similar information was admissible and used in a homicide case. Then also in the issue of cell phone dumps, and that's at 398 Wisconsin 2nd 1. And then even more recently, this was a federal case, United States versus Rego, R-I-E-G-O. Um, I just have a Westlaw site because it's 2022. It is not yet. This is 2022 Westlaw 1754 And again, those <coughs> discussed Location information and the activity and Apple health data that was admitted in those cases. I'll be happy to email copies of those to defense counsel now. Thank you. All right, we're in recess. I'll read them over. Uh, Your Honor, may I also just direct your attention to a few articles, one of which indicates the highlight here is the reliability of the registered distances. However, that's one. One of the several several articles here. And um, what I will do is I will compile the articles and, and send them all back for your review while you're considering the issue with you don't mind. Sure. And the state would also submit in terms of law review articles an individual in that case was convicted as well based on some of the data. Yeah. May I just ask if the state is making the representation that all the cases she's citing to do not require that she that a witness establish the reliability of the technology it's just put in? It has been admitted, and I have some of it. send everything that I'm giving to his honor and copy to you as well. Okay. Thank you. We're in recess. Thanks, Judge. When a juror is pulled out of the jury room, sat down, and being asked questions. Now, let's remember how this happened. This was because she asked a question of the prosecutor, and there is an admonition that you shouldn't speak to the parties. And the prosecutor, if I heard this right at the time, indicated that he didn't know anything about it, about the mistrial motion. Now the judge comes out. It's clean. She heard about the mistrial motion because it was stated in court. And that's what she was asking about. She didn't hear from an outside influence. But I had to tell you, if I were the prosecutor in this case, I'd be concerned that a juror got pulled out, the juror clearly knows I'm the one who gave the information to the court, and the juror, I told the juror that they didn't, I didn't know anything about that, which they shouldn't have said in the first place. The juror may not all be too happy with the prosecutor at this point. Thoughts? I agree. They might think, well, hey, you know, everything I'm saying, even this little unimportant thing is going to get back to the judge. But on the other hand, it may also uh, strengthen the, the credibility of the prosecutor, right? Because 
uh, the jury's not going to say, hey, you know what, this this uh, this prosecutor plays by the rules, is above board, and doesn't want there to be any bias, any prejudice, anything like that. So it cuts both ways, to be honest. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess uh, uh, let me go to the FBI, CIA, you know, specialist over here. I, I just think that that could be tried. It's a fair point, fair point. But he also said he didn't know anything about that when she clearly knows it was said inside the courtroom. So I'm not sure if that really is going to bolster his credibility in her mind. And nevertheless, she got kind of called out. It's just sloppy. It's just something that the prosecutor shouldn't even. I'd be thinking about it, and I don't want to be thinking about stuff. What do you think? Well, I, I see where Miguel was coming from, for sure, because I do think that it does ultimately cut both ways. But, Bob, I really appreciate you saying what you did about how it really is about winning the hearts and minds of the jury. I've said that on here before and sometimes to the chagrin of other people. But that's the bottom line, and that's what ultimately matters in this. And I do think that a juror who's being called out by the judge, and he's not doing it in an inappropriate way, but that is an incredibly intimidating situation in an already precarious situation, quite frankly, that they're in. This is somewhat of a charged courtroom. And so I really don't think that ultimately this is going to bode well for the prosecution in this case. However, I don't know that it's going to sort of be the ultimate nail in their proverbial coffin, if you will. Yeah, you know, listen, it, it, there's a whole Olympic-sized swimming pool of data that goes into winning a case. I guess I was the kind of person that didn't even want to see a drop come out of that pool. So uh, you're right. It probably has no great effect. In, but in the end analysis, just another unforced error. On a note, we're going to take a break. We'll be back on the other end. Please stay with us.
I totally agree with Tracy. You don't have to prove the motive or show a motive, but here's the thing, the jurors, they're, they're every, you know, they're people just like everybody else and they want to know why, right? Why, if these two deceased were in the same group, in the same musical group as, as the defendant, why would he shoot them, right? Was, was it for gangs? Was it for money, profits? What was going on? Business disputes? So I think it's super important that they get to that why, because everybody wants to know why, why, why did it happen? But, well, well, Tracy, let me go back to you. Why, why, why did it happen? And what really shocks me about this, let's keep in mind, this is a death penalty case. And even if they get a capital murder conviction, it goes into the sentencing phase, the penalty phase. And one of the aggravating factors is that this was a gang related shooting. I don't know where's the beef. I don't know where the evidence is or whatever. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's something else. If we don't have motive in a case like this, how do they get to that significant aggravating factor to justify the death penalty? And if they can't, why is this a death penalty case? I think that's, you hit it the nail on the head and I know it's like nails on a chalkboard. And again, you don't have to have this to convict someone, I get it. But again, you've got these aggregate aggravating factors that they've brought into play here. And if they can't prove that why, particularly in the gang offense, then they've essentially overcharged him, over sentenced him, if you will. And that will be problematic and can, can result in a not guilty verdict. Yeah, well, let me ask you, Miguel, and we're gonna give you the last uh, couple of seconds here. Uh, this now no longer has to be proven by 12 people. The law has changed, and now only eight people have to vote with the death penalty. Would is, is it possible we're going to start getting more death penalty verdicts that we previously would not have gotten on weaker evidence because we've lowered the standard? And if so, what do you think our appellate courts will do with that, including the U.S. Supreme Court? I've got about 45 seconds. I think it's going to keep the appellate courts very busy, the fact that it's lowered down to eight means that there's, you're right, there's going to be uh, people that are going to be convicted on weaker evidence. And that's problematic, right? Because, I mean, we're talking about the ultimate punishment, right? And so I definitely think that it's probably going to be something that's going to go to the Supreme Court. I think, I, I really think that this is going to be an issue that's going to be revisited. Eight to four seems, you know, mm, it's right. troublesome. Yeah, well, you know, this is exactly the reason. If you keep lowering the standard down, I guess eventually, even though the quality of the evidence may be weak, you're eventually going to get somebody to say vote for the death penalty. Maybe we should go down to two or one. I don't know. Guys, thanks very much. That's it for us. Don't go anywhere. Your capable hands, Imran Ansari is next. Have a great rest of the week.
Good afternoon and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Imran Ansari. Our trial coverage takes us to Broward County, Florida for the trial of rapper Jamel Demenz, better known as his stage name, YNW Melly. The South Florida rapper is charged with two counts of first degree murder for the deaths of his friend Christopher Thomas Jr. and Anthony Williams. Thomas, who was known as YNW Juvie, and Williams, who was known as YNW Sack Chaser, were all part of the YNW Collective, along with co-defendant Cortland Henry, who will be tried separately. Court was off to a late start today, only calling their first witness of the day this afternoon, before court went on a brief recess, but there were some discussions outside the presence of the jury. Let's head into that courtroom for more now. An app on the phone. that purports to account for the number of steps that someone takes. In addition to these cases, I have several articles. There have been lawsuits about the accuracy of the data that is compiled by this type of app because what it's doing is it's assessing reverberations. So for example, one of The experts we spoke to indicated that his wife plays a piano at church, and every time she goes to church and comes back, she's taken 20,000 steps. Because she's doing like that. So, the fact is that whether or not this information is reliable, yet to be determined whether or not the technology has advanced to the point of being reliable is yet to be determined. But this court cannot admit it. until the, first, the state first meets its burden of establishing the reliability of the data that is compiled or purportedly developed as a result of the Because we don't know if that technology is accurate. Whether it is I'm not taking a position at this time. I know I've read a lot of cases. Articles that indicate that it's not. However, the state has the burden as, as an authentication, or at least the, the, the expert, not even the, the man. But, and so we raised the Dalbert issue. We gave notice of an expert. The state took issue with it, raised the Dalbert objection.
to it at that time. This is not a situation. where the state presents us an expert. They, I, and And we can't anticipate that the state is going to try to admit evidence. before they admit it without the necessary praise. And those cases actually speak to the objection being made at the time that it is sought to be introduced. As a matter of fact, some of those cases rejected the appeal Because even though the predicate wasn't made, the objection wasn't made at the time the evidence was sought to be introduced. The state. Sought to introduce evidence without laying a foundation. Our objection is objection foundation. We're not making a Daubert objection to an expert who's testifying. He doesn't purport to be an expert. This is not a Daubert situation, Judge. This is a lack of foundation situation. And the that that foundation needs to be presented by somebody with expertise and knowledge doesn't make it a downward question.
it's a foundation for us. And before the state, I think those cases. If the state is planning to put evidence in that relies upon the technology. They first have to establish the reliability of that technology. And that's the basis of our objection with respect to this. that. We've also made a relevancy objection to the fact that there is a wholesale dump of information coming in through a witness who said I haven't even looked at it. How do we know that the information in there is relevant? How do we know that the information that has been introduced is not? Uh, more Prejudicial and probative, even if relevant, on a 403. <coughs> How do we know that it's not? Does it contain 404B evidence that's inadmissible? The state has to establish the relevance of the information they seek to put in. They can't just just put in everything from a phone and. through what they think and then the jury has in its possession a host of majority information that's not relevant to the proceeding, which is prejudicial. So, that, that is the other basis for our objection.
Also, a lot of the information contained there is hearsay. They said, well, it's his phone, so there's no hearsay objection. There are texts between people. There's also evidence that we have that is Establishes that that phone was being used. The, the phone comes up as a name. Sack Chaser Howard. Sack Chaser is the nickname of one of the decedents. That phone is used interchangeably so much that when you dial with it, it comes up with one of the decedents name as the Identified. It's in the name of Jamie King, not Jamel Demons. It was retrieved. from uh, Jameson Francois.
not Jamel Demons. So it's neither in his name, it wasn't retrieved from him, and it comes up with an ID. It was being used after the defendant was arrested. We have information here that indicates that, definitively. It shows the phone being used to call. It shows the same step data from from that very unit after he is incarcerated. So it's it's obvious that it's being used by several other people. So we can't even say that it's here. His phone and the information there is therefore all relevant. All information on it is is non hearsay because. Uh, statements of the defendant. Not only is it being used by others to text. To call being carried by others, it's in somebody else's name, which retrieved from someone else, and this witness has not analyzed a single letter, all the information that he can put in. So the, it, the there is a ton of irrelevant evidence that is being introduced and a lot of it
is going to be prejudicial. 404. B and 403 evidence and that that's why we objected before. I didn't wait until after because One of the points that the court made is you already let it in. We have checked it before, Judge, and you told us. Overruled, let it in. It's still a problem, right? And we're trying to To, to stem the damage before it goes too far. And I, we think that the issue has to be addressed before this information is used and it goes forward both on the foundation issue, on the technology issue, authentication issue, relevancy issue, 403, 404B issue. Thank you. The relevancy yes. issue is relatively low, counsel. Uh, my understanding, where's the phone located at, counsel? The phone itself? Yeah.
Where was, it, where was the phone located? The phone was located, it was taken from the defendant's manager on February of 2019. The defendant was providing the passcode and information via jail calls to his manager. Use it on that. And the phone also authenticates itself in terms of every single photo that is on that, whether it be a cell selfie, a screenshot of a face time conversation or anything of that goes back to this defendant. Mm -hmm. And they have to establish it before they put it in. Not after the fact. This notion that they possess information that makes it relevant. If they do, present it. And then it's relevant at that time. Um, we have, Your Honor, Um, indications of, of this cell phone and this Instagram account. account that she that the state. introduced the Instagram account is being used to post pictures
days after his arrest. Up to and including pictures of this very trial last week. This Instagram is being used and accessible to a number of people. This notion that, oh, it's his He's an artist. There's, it's a public account that several people have access to. I'm sure you're going to be able to ask those type of questions, Council. My, my thought is this, Council. Uh, it it's not fair to basically give me an inch worth of things to read, cases to read. Articles to read saying it's how it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, the methodology is uh, and the the uh, basically a Daubert issue on. It's not not uh, clear. It's not been established. Uh, All those types of things that should have been on pre-trial. I haven't seen what's on the the uh, uh, the
the account. I, I don't disagree with that. Council's telling me it's wrong because of X, Y. either. You're saying it's not, but I don't know what, what uh, what is the four Free analysis. What's more prejudicial and probative? I, I I haven't seen anything about. that I don't know what it is. I haven't seen it. You haven't made me aware of it. You're just saying it's... something more prejudicial than appropriate. If it is, I'm more than happy to go through one at a time with and find out. But as far as who used the phone, uh, what was it being done, council saying it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, relevant uh, to Establish his phone. So I, I've made my ruling. You, you've made your objection. So everybody knows. Where they stand on it. All right, so it's admitted. Okay. All right. Thank you.
the jury back in. Yes. I don't think he has any relevant information. He said. These pussies keep trying to stop the video. Ain't no sense in stopping it now. Let it go. Let that girl say, let it go. Let it go. When y'all niggas want to let him blow. Let it go. Let it go. Because Melly won't come home no more. Eh, 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 eh. I'm not your mama. You sure not? And Melly mama do got some penis sucking lips. Who got mad about that? Who ain't like it? Who ain't like it? What up, gang? Bell Gates, what the deal? What the deal? Draco, baby, what the deal? What the deal? What the deal? They keep freezing the video on purpose, y'all. Don't get frustrated with it. They doing this shit on purpose. They do not want you to know what the really dilly is. But you know what? I brought as much of this shit as I could for the day. I've been going three hours strong on it. They know. They know. And we don't stop. And think about this here. That video skipping, right? If there is a ton of irrelevant evidence that is being introduced, and a lot of it is going to be prejudicial, 404B and 403 evidence, and that's why we objected before. I didn't wait until after, because one of the points that the court made is you already let it in. We objected before, Judge, and you told us, overruled, let it in. It's still a problem right now, and we're trying to, to, to stem the damage before it goes too far. And I, we think that the issue has to be addressed before this information is used and it goes forward both on the foundation issue, on the technology issue, authentication issue, relevance. They don't want to admit this shit. Melly done for. Relevancy issue, 403, 404 B issue. Yes. Thank you. The relevancy yes. issue is relatively low, counsel. Uh, my understanding, where's the phone located at, counsel? The phone itself? Yeah. That will be introduced through the technology. Now, where was, it, where was the phone located? The phone was located, it was taken from the defendant's manager on February of 2019. The defendant was providing the passcode and information via jail calls to his manager to use it on that. And the phone also authenticates itself in terms of every single photo that is on that, whether it be a selfie, a screenshot of a FaceTime conversation, or anything of that, goes back to this defendant. Then they have to establish it before they put it in, not after the fact, on this notion that they possess information that makes it relevant. If they do, present it, and then it's relevant at that time. Um, we have, Your Honor, 
um, indications of, of the cell phone. The jury's still going to hear this. And, and, and Cortland's still going to testify against Melly. I'm telling you. And this Instagram account that, she, that the state has introduced, the Instagram account is being used to post pictures days after his arrest, up to and including pictures of this very trial last week. This Instagram account is being used and accessible to a number of people. This notion that, oh, it's his account, he's an artist. There's, it's a public account that several people have access to. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to be able to ask those type of questions, Counsel. My, my thought is this, Counsel. Uh, it, it's not fair to basically give me an inch worth of things to read, cases to read, articles to read, saying it's how it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, the methodology is uh, and the, the uh, basically the Albert issue on it. It's not, not uh, clear. It's not been established, uh, all those types of things. That should have been done pre-trial. I haven't seen what's on the the uh, uh, the, the account. I, I don't disagree with that. Council's telling me it's wrong because of X, Y, and Z. There, you're saying it's not, but I don't know what what uh, what is the 403 analysis. What's more prejudicial and probative? I, I I haven't seen anything about that. I don't know what it is. I haven't seen it. You haven't made me aware of it. You're just saying it's something more prejudicial than probative. If it is, I'm more than happy to go through one at a time with you and find out. But as far as who used the phone, uh, what was it being done? Council saying it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, relevant uh, to establish his phone. So I, I've made my ruling. You, you've made your objection. So everybody knows where they stand on it. All right, so it's admitted. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, bring the jury back in. I don't think he has any relevant information. He said. Bring a jury. I may ask a few. Thank you. For our good delay, please be seated. Let the record once again reflect the question of the defendant, the counsel, the assistant state attorney, the lady and gentlemen of the jury, all witness for me to understand. So do you have a question, counsel? Yes, I have a few more, Your Honor. Thank you. You did, sir, two data dumps from the device in question.
Did you have the data verified by any third party for completeness of the download? No. And you made that decision. Was it your decision whether or not to do that? Kind of verification? Yes. Okay, and you elected not to? Correct, I elected not to. Did you have an engineer View any of the data that you retrieved? No. And have you validated that the Celebrite extracts in the data that you did were in fact complete? The extraction is the extraction, and that's what I got. That's what the machine gave me. Yes. Okay, and, and how did you? Verify that the machine gave you a complete download. I understand when you say a complete download. You think you don't understand what I mean? No. They're not sitting by each other because they know what time it is. Portland is going to fucking rat on that boy. I'm about to end this shit, y'all. I'm going to come back on later because they're trying to play me out with all this shit pausing. And I'm keep running in and out. So I'm not really here to patrol this motherfucker. The, the, you know what I'm saying? But just know, y'all. Melly. Smelly Melly. You're done. Smelly Melly is done, boy. You shouldn't have done it. You feeling sad and blue.